the seed is the word of God. It's not our actions. So we have to speak for them to hear that. And that's what I think is so awesome is that we have to be bold with our words. Uh, for this church and we thank you for this fellowship we don't thank you enough for it Lord and I pray that this would be a sanctified place even though we rent you know a worldly property Lord, we pray that during these times God that it's given to you yeah, we don't seek to build it for our sake Lord or for numbers or anything God but we seek to build your kingdom Lord to point people to you and allow souls to be saved and I pray that this is a godly place that preaches your truth men and women would hear it and would repent and turn to you father they wouldn't put their their faith in in flynn lord or, or anyone else god but that it would be a place that that uh comes humbly before your throne lord and chooses to follow you and we thank you for opening up these doors and giving us the the finances to be able to provide for it and we give it right back to you father let us be available to hear your word. Take over this vessel, Lord. Allow your word to be preached. Don't allow man to give its opinion today. God, we seek to know you and be sanctified by your truth. Because your word is truth, Father. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Let's go ahead and turn to Matthew 13. Since you're talking about Matthew... I'll turn to Matthew 13. And uh, I'm just going to kind of fly through here. I, I don't have any preconceived idea or notion on the direction that we should go. Uh, it's been a heavy week and um, just really learning a lot. And uh, just, my main prayer going through here is that God would would soften our hearts because um, I know uh, the Lord is really hearkening on me a lot lately about pride and um, and so I'm not necessarily trying to tell you guys it's the Lord really smacking me down and saying look come to me and and let me be that you know when I lived in Seattle we used to rent this uh, we used to rent this thing this auger and would go through and it would till the ground. And you knew when someone used one because it looked so fresh and everything was pulled up from the bottom. And it wasn't about a person going out there hitting a shovel, you know, Tucson, and you just barely skim the surface. But the auger gets in there and it, it makes it look fresh and it, it's clean soil. And that's what I want the Lord to do. You know, I want him to just beat me up and tear it apart, you know. So that's why we're going to go through here. And I pray that uh, it encourages you. Um, we're going to go through, uh, starting in verse 1. It says, The same day when Jesus, out of the house, went Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside. And great multitudes were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat. And the whole multitude stood on the shore. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, the sower went forth to sow. When he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside. And the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth. Forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. When the sun was up, they were scorched. Because they had no root, they withered away. Some fell among thorns. The thorns sprung up and choked them out. Other fell on good ground, brought forth fruit, some a hundred, some sixty, some thirtyfold. Who hath ears? to ear let them hear stop there and we'll go back through this a little bit I plan on going through further but the power that Jesus spoke with was it was capturing even the people that didn't believe in him that were angry at him had to sit around and listen it says the the Pharisees and the and the you know the Sadducees followed him around because they wanted to know what he was going to say, because he spoke with conviction. 
He spoke with truth, and he didn't just speak words to capture someone's ear and just to go on with a story. I don't know if you ever met people like that, but when, I, when I'm talking to someone at the swap meet, you know, I can tell when someone doesn't want to, they don't want to hear, and they're just kind of wasting their time. But at the same time, I've also met tons of people that just want to carry the whole conversation, and there's no meaning to it at all, and they'll just carry it, and they'll talk and talk and talk. I'm like, where are you going with this? And it just kind of feels like they just want to take control of the situation, but they don't want to go anywhere with it, you know? But Jesus spoke with authority. He was very clear, and he had intention when he spoke. And when he went on the ship, he had a very clear purpose on why he was speaking. It says he spoke in parables, and we'll read later in, in Isaiah that there, there was a reason. Not only was he fulfilling prophecy, because it says that he would speak in parables, but he was speaking to specific people all in the same area. And we're talking hundreds of people. It says that there were, there were I don't know if there was thousands, or I think that at one time it says there were 500, you know, that were clearly paying attention. But I think in Acts, I can't remember, sorry, I don't want to speculate there. But the purpose is there's crowds of people following him, okay? And not every single people, people in there were followers. It says, He spake many things unto them in parables, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And he sowed some seeds, fell by the wayside, and fowls came and devoured them. Now, a parable is like an analogy for us today. It's a way to explain something. My wife's really good at analogies. I remember when I first came to the Lord, it was analogy after analogy. And I'm like, oh, wow, really? Like that? Oh, that makes sense. Because when you hear something explained in another context, it kind of sets on you, and it's a way for you to chew on it and bring understanding, right? But at the same time, you could tell someone that same parable to someone else, and it goes right over their head, you know? And you're like, why don't you get it? It's a really easy understanding. Jesus spoke with these ways because it was a way to sift, like sifting flour. You want the chumps out, you know? You want, you want, some of the, you want the, the good, fine stuff to get through, and the other stuff you're going to cast away. He was, he was speaking to people's hearts. And the thing that speaks out to me first, when I first read verse 4, I think about the Christian, okay? And you're like, wait, we haven't even got to the Christian yet. That's the hardened ground. I mean, the, the good ground. But the sower, sowing the seed, okay? The seed is the word of God, we'll read later. But it says, when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside. I've read this passage so many times. And I've never caught that it says they fell by the wayside. I always assumed that the first seed was thrown. But this is just naturally things falling away. I looked at the word and I should have wrote it down. But fell means fell. Like you have a bag and things are they're overflowing and it's just constantly falling out because it's so full, right? That's what this sower is doing. He's walking along a side. He hasn't even got to the field yet. And there's seeds falling out. Now, if the seed is the word of God, and we're there to sow seeds, not like Creflo Dollar going out and giving money. He says that the seed is, you know, giving money and you'll bring a harvest. No, the seed is the word of God. So if we're called to sow these seeds, and we haven't even got to the field yet, why is God giving us this example of seeds falling out of us? Out of the, I picture a bag, you know, a guy, a farmer walking along, He's got a big bag, and he's getting ready to grab them. But before he even throws there, they're falling away. That's because naturally, as believers, we should be overflowing with the gospel. You know, whether you're at work, and you don't even see the intention to go out and share the gospel, you naturally just share it. You know, you're on the phone with someone, you're talking to... I listen to this guy a lot from Living Waters, Mark Spence, and he'll get phone calls from, from people, salespeople, you know, and he records them. Whenever he sees a, a toll-free number call him, he pushes this record thing on his phone. He records his conversations because he sees the opportunity to share the gospel. It just comes natural. He wasn't even going out and trying to plant the seed, right? And that's what ministered to me on this. When I saw that, I was like, do I naturally share the gospel? Or is it only when I have the intention to go out and do it on a Friday night? You know. But when you go to the grocery store, be always ready to just naturally share the grace of God that he's come into your life and that he's good. 
because naturally it should be falling out of us. It should be overflowing, right? I don't want to harbor that too much, but I just thought that was interesting that he, it says fell by the wayside. Kind of like by your actions, the way they see, the way you act, the way you are with other people, they see that difference. In well, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That should be the, the building ground. But that's not the gospel. You know, someone can't see your works and just say, oh, they must be a Christian. You know, they have to hear it. And that's what the word of God is. It says these seeds. God will read later when he explains it. Uh, you know, I should have wrote further, but the seed is the word of God. It's not our actions. So we have to speak for them to hear that. And that's what I think is so awesome is that we have to be bold with our words. Like Flynn's been doing a lot of of teachings lately the last couple times on words and what the purpose of them and being intentional with them and that's that's how we should be you know we should be redeeming the time having a renewing of our mind and being able to to see before we say speak before we act slow to speak right uh the the i can't remember the verse but it says be wise as a serpent gentle as a dove you know I'm not saying you're going to be mischievous like a snake but you need to be intentional you know when you ever watch a snake some people don't like it, but I like watching those shows where the snake creeps up on its, you know, it's like predator shows. They're very intentional. They're slithering in there. They don't just attack. They make sure they're going to get that catch. And though we're not going to, like, devour people like, like Satan, but we're being very intentional. We're being very thoughtful, you know, when we're going to share the gospel. It says, some fell, when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and fowls came devoured them up some fell stony places where they had not much earth forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth when the sun was up they were scorched and because they had no root they withered up and some fell among thorns thorns sprung up and choked them but other fell into good ground brought forth 160 and 30 fold now I'll let, I'll let Jesus explain this when we get into it later because it's very clear. But he's talking about four soils. You guys have heard this, this parable before, right? It's pretty, it's pretty common. Um, the thing that I love about, about the parable of the four soils, a lot of people use this to manipulate and say, this is, you're one of these. And this is your life. And if you receive it this way, then that's it. And they use this as a way to you know, to kind of preach their way at people with a, with a fear and trembling, make sure you're right. And though that's a, good, that's a good way to approach it, the issue I have with that is, at times, we're all those different soils. I can honestly say that there's been a time in my life where I have been every single one of these soils. So for someone to tell me, oh, it's this way, you're one of these soils, and that's it, I can't, I can't run with that because I know at one time I heard the word of God for years, like the first one. And it, the, the seeds just got devoured up. They didn't even make it to my heart. God was faithful my whole life. You know, a lot of testimonies people say, well, it was a moment that um, God came to me and I, and I realized it. But my testimony, I know God was good to me my whole life. I remember hearing the gospel when I was five years old, and I wanted nothing to do with it. You know, I, I didn't have the desire to follow this gracious God. I wanted to do what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a kid and have fun in this world, you know, and do the things I wanted to do. So, four different soils, realizing that you can be a Christian. And I'll say this, I'll say this lightly, and if you think I say it wrong, you can be one of these even as a Christian. This is not talking about specifically a salvational condition. And I'll explain in a little bit when we, when we go into it further. Starting in verse 10, it says, And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He, said, he answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. So here's why, we're, here's why Jesus spoke with the authority and why he was very clear on speaking in certain analogies. He says, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of, of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not. Now that sounds like a very partial God, right? Why is he only giving certain 
meanings to one people to make sure that the other people won't believe. That almost sounds like Calvinism, right? I don't know if you guys are familiar with Calvinism. Calvinism says that um, a person uh, doesn't have the opportunity to be saved unless God grants them the opportunity. And he specifically predestines some people to hell, predestines some people to heaven. That's, that's partiality, right? You guys know partiality? That's what it sounds like to me. And, and someone could manipulate this and says, because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of kingdom of heaven. So he gave it to them. He granted them the mysteries. And if I stopped there, you'd be like, wow, it must be true. God must be a partial God. And I've heard Calvinists. I, I talk to a lot of them. I have some really good friends. I've heard them use this as an opposition, as a way to defend their case. But you have to keep reading. And, and, and my desire, I, I always got to keep chewing on it. I'm like, God's got to be meaning something more here. Verse 12, For whoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whoever hath not from him shall be taken away even that he has. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seen see not. In hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. When I read that, I picture the, the Pharisees that came to Jesus after the blind man got sight. And they were trying to charge him. And they were saying, who do you say that this guy is? And he's saying, all I know is that once I was blind and now I see. He didn't know who Jesus was. But then, then the blind man comes back to Jesus later. And he says, why, you know, why did you do this to me? Why, why, did, why were you faithful to reveal this to me? He says, because you claimed that you could not see, and so I gave you sight. And the, and the Pharisee, and he says, but there are some out there that say that they can see, and yet they're blind. You know. First of all, the reason why I want to bring that up is because, because of the Calvinistic charge, you know, saying that God only grants certain people why would Jesus tell a man that because you say you cannot see, I give you sight? How can that man even recognize that he has no sight if he can't see? Like, I, I'm not trying to drop into like a deep black hole and make our brains fry up. But literally, if a person cannot see and has no awareness of seeing, then they have no idea what they're talking about. But clearly, we have the... the um, I don't know how to say this clearly, because even my brain gets wrapped around it sometimes. When, when a Calvinist says that a person has no option to see because they're just blind, then they're not held accountable for their blindness, right? Because they're just blind and they cannot see at all. But Christ is saying we can be aware of our blindness. I think that's what I'm trying to get at. And he's saying, therefore speak I to them in parables because they see see not and hear they hear not neither do they understand that goes back to sharing the four different soils and going to the to the swap meet and you can be talking to someone when we went out and met you guys we started talking you wanted to talk you wanted to hear and you wanted to know what was going on who are these guys that talk about Jesus you know that's what it's about and they had questions the disciples came and said unto him why speak thou in parables doesn't necessarily mean you have to understand right away. Jesus doesn't say those that, you know, whoever hath to him shall be given because they already had understanding. No, the choice is, is wanting to understand. And everyone starts out at the same slate. Everyone starts out blind. And the issue is, is, is the Calvinist says that some people start out being able to see and then I give them better sight. That's not how it works. We're all blind, we're all lost, we're all in darkness. None of us understand. And when Christ shares the same message to every single one of us, some of us say, I want nothing to do with that. I don't understand it, and it's a hard saying. In Acts 18, you can read that when he was speaking, when Paul was speaking at Mars Hill, at the very end, it says there's three types of people. And it says the first people, they said they mocked him and they walked away. And they heard the stuff he was saying, and they just said, this guy's crazy. There was a second people that said, I'll come tomorrow and just keep talking about it. And then there was a third people that said, I believe this and I will follow you. That's where our hearts are. Whether we want to know about it or if we want to understand 
We have to come to Christ for that knowledge. Therefore, I, therefore speak I to them in parables, because seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which says, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall perceive not. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, should be converted, and should heal them, and I should heal them. Turn with me to Isaiah 6 real quick, so that we can understand why Christ brings this up. I'm sure most of you guys are familiar with this passage. This is when... God calls Isaiah, and Isaiah sees the throne. He sees God. God reveals himself to him. Isaiah 6. We'll start in verse 1. It says, In that year that King Uzziah died, I saw, Isaiah's writing, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings, with twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. Could you imagine seeing that? Could you imagine seeing this, this picture? Uh, I, I, I wouldn't be like Isaiah, I'd be crying and weeping. He's like, he, his heart is revealed like he, he says, woe is I, you know, we'll read, but man, I can't even fathom God revealing himself to me. I, I just, it's a beautiful picture. Uh, verse 4 says, um, And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth, and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. And also I heard the voice of the Lord, saying, Whom shall I send? Whom will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, make their ears heavy, shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert and be healed. So the first, like, it's an order, you know. Not only does the Christian go out and share the gospel, the Christian bows at the feet of Christ. I always, I'm always amazed, you know, when we're out on the street and someone tells us, you know, how dare you, you judge me, you know, how dare you um, think you're better than me, you know. And I always, I always want to like cry right to him and be like, I really do not think I'm better than you. That is not why I'm out here. I'm seriously aware of my sin. I'm just the same beggar as you, but I know where the bread is. You know, like that's our purpose. We're not coming at you being better than you. And so Isaiah recognizes his sin. He says, I'm a man of unclean lips. His sins are taken away, and then God calls him to go. And he says, here I am, I'm going. But God says, go and tell this people, hear ye indeed, but understand not. These are people that literally believe that they have it all figured out. You know, you talk to professors, you know, big uh, atheists, uh, you know, preaching evolution every day. Those are the people that scripture talk about professing to be wise, they became fools. Because they literally are so devoted to what they think is right. They're not open to the truth at all. They're not open to talking. It's a giant argument and you see their anger. They get furious. They, their blood boils. They shut down. They do not hear. They listen. They do not hear. They have no 
They have no desire to understand. And so our job is to go and share. And it says, make the heart of this people fat. Make their ears heavy. That's why when we pray for the people we share the gospel with, we pray that God would, would disrupt their sleep and keep them heavy all night. And that they wouldn't be satisfied until they, they come to God for their thirst. Because it's only the word of God that can do that. Make them heavy. Shut their eyes lest they see with their eyes and hear with the ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. Now look at the contrast between 10 and then go back to 13 and look at the end of uh, verse 15. He's quoting, Jesus is quoting Isaiah, okay? Sorry if I confused you guys. Look at the end of verse 10 in Isaiah that we just read and then look at the end of verse 15. I'll read it to you. In verse 10 it says, and convert and be healed. Well, we know that God is speaking because he just delivered Isaiah and proved that he took away his iniquity. But at the end of verse 13, it's Jesus speaking, and he's quoting that verse in Isaiah. He says, should understand with their heart and should be converted, and I should heal them. Who wrote Isaiah? Who, who, who gave Isaiah, the words to, to write. The Holy Spirit. Who's operating right now? It says, I should heal them. This is, this is God. Who can deny that? Jesus spoke with that authority. I, I've read that tons of times and I've always missed that. He quotes Isaiah, but he speaks in first tense because he is God. He's declaring his deity. He says, I should heal them. What an awesome God. We come to him for healing. We'll finish this out real quick. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear and have not heard them. The purpose of God, I love that he uses these soils and then he uses the parables to even explain the, the soils. The, the definition of the parable itself and fulfilling prophecy, he's saying, look, all these people are hearing the same message and they all have the opportunity to receive it in turn because how can they even hear it and deny it unless they have hearing? The issue isn't hearing. The issue is, is wanting to understand it. He says, For verily I say that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see and have not seen them, to hear those things which ye hear and have not heard. Now hear the parable of the sower. Sower, When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and understands it not, then comes the wicked one and catches away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receives seed by the wayside. I was like that all the way up till... 17 or 18 my heart was always hard I remember my wife girlfriend at the time sharing the gospel with me and crying begging me to receive Christ and I laughed that's that's mockery and though the word was faithfully being preached she was the sower sharing the seed on the wayside and I picked it right up and tossed it away Satan devoured it because I wanted nothing to do with it but he that receives the seed into stony places, the same as he that hears the word, and anon with joy receives it. Now I'm going to take it a step further. I started to go to church. I started to hear the gospel before we were married. And I hear the gospel, and I receive it. I say, that sounds great. I raised my hand in an altar call, went to church for two years. This is where I was. My heart was hard. I received it, it was stony, but I received it because I had hearing, because I heard the words that were speaking and it sounded nice. It tickled my ear and I loved it and I was like, I want, I want that, but at the same time I want to keep doing what I'm doing. Yet he has not root in himself, but endures for a while. But when tribulation or persecution arise because of the word, by and by he is offended. 
I traveled around. I was an aircraft mechanic. I traveled all around, went to New York, went to California, I went all over. And I remember telling people, I'm a Christian. I received, I received Jesus, I raised my hand. And they're like, okay, let's go to the bar. Okay, I'm right behind you. I went right with them, and they laughed at me. They, they did it with mockery towards God. I didn't see it at the time. I was, I was trying to justify myself, and it really became the next ground that we'll talk about in a little bit. But I definitely remember the time where I cast God away, even though I was like, I recognize you, God, I need you. But any time there was an opportunity for me to stand up for him and say, no, I choose to follow you, I denied him. I chose to be wicked. And that was that stony ground. Again, our hearts, are, are it's conditional to the situations. He also that received seed among the thorns, verse 22, is he that hears the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. Now towards the end of my aviation career, I was in Victorville, California. And I remember really struggling with actually serving the Lord. I came back home a couple times back and forth and we hadn't done Bible studies yet. We hadn't done any Bible studies. And I remember literally struggling with two different worlds. And I cared, I decided to care more about the, the money I was making and the drugs I could do and hide and still have a better life but also claim Jesus as my as my lifesaver. He was in my back pocket. He was my insurance card. I literally choked out the word, though I was hearing it every day. And I know I'm making this personal. The scriptures aren't about me, but I'm just letting you guys see my heart because we can, we can put ourselves in every single one of these situations. But he that receives seed into the good ground is he that hears the word and understands it, which also bears fruit and brings forth some 100, some 60, and some 30. It took a non-believer, it took a non-Christian to hold me accountable at the end of one of these days and tell my wife the double life I was living. And she was furious, and she calls me, and she tells me, are you doing this? Are you acting this way? Are you perverting, you know, your image of Christ and and it took wanting to understand the difference it says here's the word and understands it I knew the whole time it was wrong but I desired to do those things wrong but the moment I wanted to understand it is when it turned to soil that was able to receive the Word of God and flourish and grow and bear fruit. The idea is not to look at these soils and say, I'm, I'm going to make my heart this way. I'm going, to, I'm going to become a tree that's fruitful. You can't look at the fruit. You can't look at, at, at anything other than the Word of God that's going into your heart and just want to understand Him. Because we have knowledge every day. Me and my wife are talking about every day. We have tons of knowledge, but do we actually understand? And are we actually practicing what we preach? You know, do we actually want to endure through the worldly times and allow to receive it in our heart? That's the purpose of this. I could keep going on the other parables. I wanted to finish this, but we're actually running low on time. The first point I really want to, to set in is which soil are you today? Whether you're a Christian or not, which soil are you today? And recognizing where you have been before. Are you actually growing in the Lord or are you actually going backwards in the soils? Because it can definitely be a dangerous place to be but I'm not saying that this is a salvational situation. If you're a stony place 
and you've received the word and you sprung up and you're happy about it, but you don't really feel like you're growing in the Lord or anywhere, it, it doesn't mean that you're not saved. Because I know that right now, in the place of my heart, that's kind of where I feel. Like, I feel like my heart is hard. Not because I don't believe Christ, but just because the place in life that I am, like when I'm working every day, my heart is hard and I don't receive the word well. You know, when I'm corrected or when I read the word at lunchtime, you know, I, it, it doesn't go anywhere. So don't, don't fear because you don't know the Lord. I'm just saying that this is an opportunity to read this. Go back through this and read this later. Really pray and ask the Lord, where is my heart today? You know, and want to understand it. I love in Ezekiel, he says that there's a, there's a heart that's of stone, and I'm going to give you a heart of flesh. If you desire to know him more, then give him that praise. That means that you want to know him. And, and every day, look back and say, am I still in the same place I am, or am I actually moving forward? I think that's what Christ is pointing out to us, to, to take heed and examine yourselves whether you are in the faith. And if you are in the faith, run the race. Don't be drowned out by the other things. Desire him and grow in him. You know? That's it. You guys have anything to add on that? Questions on there? Let's pray. Lord, Father, thank you, Lord, for, for your perfect parables, God. We can come up with analogies and images that we think that we understand, Lord, but they're all flawed. The picture you give us, Lord, of our hearts, how wicked they can be. Your word says we don't even know them, Lord. I know that I can praise you right now, God, and in two hours I'll be frustrated about something, about a driver, or the way someone talks to me, Lord, my heart will harden up. God, that's how wicked we are. Our emotions drive our actions every day. Now, may it not be so. God, you're our hands, and we just simply need to be the gloves that you put on, Lord, and you use. Strike us down from trying to be the ones doing the work. Let us just trust in you, Father. Break up these, these grounds, Lord, and allow us to receive your word daily. Be moved by you, Father, so that not only can we grow closer with you intimately, but, God, that we can lead others to you. What hypocrites we would be, God, if we're walking around daily saying that we know where the, the true clean water is and yet we're drinking from fountains of mud. Let us take the logs out of our eyes before we go around pointing on others, Lord. Not that we shouldn't be standing up for your truth, Lord. But let us judge our own hearts first. Let's be clean before you as Isaiah, Lord. Burn our iniquity out of us. Let us be clean by you, not by our temporary efforts. Help us serve you this week, Father. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.